rise. The Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, we are here for argument in Jones Outdoor Advertising versus the Arizona Department of Revenue. Our cause number is CATX 140006. Uh, both sides will have 20 minutes for argument. We'd ask you to identify yourself and your client when you begin. Uh, and we'd ask the appellant to reserve whatever time you'd like for, for rebuttal. Uh, as with the first case, we have uh, read the briefs. We've conferenced this matter this morning, and we look forward to your argument. May it please the court, my name is Jim Sousa with the Tucson law firm of Deacon Senior, McDonald, Yetwin and Lacey. I represent the appellant Jones Outdoor Advertising and I'm joined at council table by Cecily Stamps who is also with the law firm. This case involves uh, Jones's request to reverse the decision of the tax court for one of two reasons. The first reason is that the assessment by the department violates the tax policy of the state of Arizona. The second reason is that Jones doesn't rent anything to its advertisers. If there's a third reason you think of, well, that's fine too. Uh, in 1982, the Arizona legislature was requested to repeal the sales tax that had been imposed upon those businesses that did advertising. That tax had been around since 1935 as part of the very first tax act. During that legislative session, a number of people were represented in front of the legislature by an attorney here in Phoenix uh, who did tax work uh, with the Snell Wilmer Law Firm. And he prepared, and it's in the record, a very lengthy uh, fact sheet as to why the repeal was being requested. And when you review that, which is in the record, you'll see that the primary purpose was to eliminate the tax that had been imposed on those businesses that had been in advertising. And that was television, radio, billboards, anybody that could be doing advertising had been subjected to the tax. They passed the tax on to their customers. And as a result, if they repealed the tax, then it would lower the amount uh, that the customers paid in tax, leaving more money available to pay the advertisers. So this was certainly a self-interested bill. Uh, the legislature agreed to do that. And when they agreed to do that, they didn't do it all in one shot. They, they phased out the tax. So a little bit phased out in 83, a little bit more in 84, but by 85, the last of it phased out. So in January 1, 1986, there was no more Arizona transaction privilege tax imposed on those in the business of doing advertising. The legislature sets tax policy in Arizona, and the legislature certainly can reinstitute a tax on those in the business of advertising, or even a small subset of those. Since 1982, no statute has been enacted here in Arizona that reinstituted that tax. In the tax court below, Judge Fink mistakenly believed that the 1988 renumbering of the transaction privilege tax statutes was the creation of the personal property rental classification for taxation. And as a result, because 1988 comes after 1982, he believed that that was the reinstitution of the tax upon those who were engaged in the business of advertising by billboard. That was a mistake. The rental tax, both the real and personal property tax, had been in place since 1967. The words that impose the tax has not changed since 1967. It is still imposed, as it was in 1967, as it is today in 2015, on those in the business of renting or leasing tangible personal property for consideration. So if the statute was never expanded and it was in existence when the advertising tax was in place, then we're stuck because unless the legislature meant to have two taxes on those people who did advertising by billboard, it cannot be consistent with the legislature's decision to repeal the advertising tax that the same people that flip over and are subject to tax under the personal property rental classification. That's fairly unlikely to have happened and it would be difficult to believe that in 1982, the lobbyists who went down there to get the tax repealed somehow fouled this up and left the door open for the sales tax on a subset of the people he was representing just on those who did advertising by billboard. So we believe that the department's assessment violates the tax policy of this state as enacted by our legislature in 1982, which we actually repealed the tax that specifically applied to the activities of Jones and other outdoor advertisers. Interestingly, the city codes uh, were adopted mostly after the state codes and the cities never repealed 
their tax on those engaged in advertising. Jones, when it has billboards in a city that has such a tax, pays that tax. So here's a situation where the city codes tried to mirror the state code. The state had taxed this as advertising. The city's taxed it as advertising. The state got rid of it, and the city's continued to tax it. So the specific tax category that Jones fell under was repealed by the state of Arizona, and the department's assessment violates that. The department has attempted to impose this tax under two different theories. The first theory was about 10 years ago. They assessed a company called Arizona Outdoor, which also was a billboard company. In that case, they asserted that it was the rental of real property and issued an assessment against Arizona Outdoor. Arizona Outdoor prevailed in the Board of Tax Appeal, prevailed in the Arizona Tax Court, and prevailed in the Court of Appeals. This court held that billboards weren't real property, they were personal property. Now, out of this loss, the department believes it has power to now say, therefore, the court ruled that it must be the leasing of personal property, and thus, because we have a tax on that as well, Arizona Door gives us the authority that we would need to, in fact, impose a tax on Jones. So now they've come after Jones. To be clear, Jones is not one of the large players in the Arizona billboard industry. Those would be Gannett and Clear Channel. Jones is not a mom and pop operation. It's a dad and son operation. And dad has passed on and son has now carried on the family business and son is with us in the courtroom here today. Jones has defended against this assessment, an assessment that would likely wipe out the company if it actually came to pass, on the basis that billboard companies don't rent anything to anybody. All they do is take contracts for advertising. And what's interesting is these courts, your courts, have issued a decision after decision that talks about what is renting, what is leasing. And the constant theme, whether it's in a tax context or a non-tax context, is that you have to transfer from the owner of the property exclusive possession, use, and control of the rented item. So as we were driving up today from Tucson for this argument, we were kind of stopped on I-10, right around Chandler Road, and we saw these electronic billboards. And every 15 seconds, because we weren't going anywhere, we were able to watch the ad change. And in the time it took us to get past, there were six different ads that appeared on that billboard. There may be more, but we saw six. So if you believe the department's theory, then each one of those six advertisers is renting the billboard for the 15 seconds that their ad appears on the billboard at that specific time. It's difficult to believe that to be true because there is no possession, use, or control by any one of those advertisers of the billboard for any period of time. As a classic example, Jones has a billboard on Interstate 8 that advertises the McDonald's near Gila Bend. It's right between the two X's to Gila Bend. They've had this contract for many, many years. McDonald's does not create the vinyl that goes on the billboard. McDonald's does not place the vinyl upon the billboard. McDonald's does not own the vinyl that's on the billboard. They don't do any maintenance on the billboard. Frankly, they'd be trespassing if they even touched the billboard. It's difficult to imagine a case for renting something where you can't even touch the item you're supposed to be renting. So you're saying that as a matter of undisputed fact, if McDonald's decided that it wanted to advertise McNuggets instead of Big Macs, it couldn't just go up there and change the vinyl. Yes, I am saying that. They would have to go to Jones and say, we need a brand new advertisement. Big Macs are out, McNuggets are in, uh, draft us up something, get it printed, and then Jones pays to have the printer create the vinyl. Jones pays to have the vinyl shipped to Arizona. Jones takes the vinyl. Jones drives it in its truck out to where that billboard is. Jones employees go up the ladder, up under the billboard, replace the Big Mac vinyl with the McNuggets vinyl, and that's it. McDonald's can't do anything other than say, we'd like to change, Jones has to agree to it, and then it happens. Would the analysis be different if, for electronic billboards if the company that owns the billboard simply allows someone to submit an electronic signal that somehow works its way up onto the, uh, to the billboard without any further intervention by the owner of the, the sign? Well, that's an interesting question because then there's no liability for someone climbing up there and falling down. Um, I think it would be an interesting question because you still don't have, as the McDonald's or Best Western or Cracker Barrel, any rights to the billboard itself. All you've done is entered an agreement that says, we would like to put our advertisement with your company. Um, this is the location where we'd like it to go. 
and the company has to agree, and then the company has to make it available for that to happen. And, and that happens with both electronic and with the hard copies. So the, the problem here is that if you don't transfer anything to anybody, then you can't have a rental. Isn't, isn't the department's position at least arguably consistent with PEC, uh, where there's not a complete transfer of uh, of the equipment that's being used uh, if it's in a laundromat. Right. Um, it isn't, and, and here's the reason why. In the PEC decision, the court said the startling feature of this is that the customer is the one who runs the handheld car washing equipment. The customer is the one who inserts the laundry and the quarters and the detergent into the machine. So yes, you can't take it home with you like a car that you rent, but the customer actually does everything here and the company that owns it does nothing here. There is no car wash attendant. There is no laundromat attendant to do anything. Well, here, the customer does nothing other than sign the contract. And when they sign the contract, all they're agreeing to is, in exchange for money, you'll advertise our product. That's it. If you read the contract, and we included it as an appendix to our opening brief, that contract says nothing about we transfer to you possession, use, control, anything of the billboard that we own. And it's done for a very good reason. Liability. You let some McDonald's owner climb up on that billboard and falls down, you're going to get sued back to the Stone Age. So the contracts don't allow that to happen. If they tried it, they'd be sued uh, or they'd be arrested for trespass. A contract could, in fact, state, we transfer this to you. It's your use for as long as you want it. So I have no problem with the idea of if we wrote the contract that way, we might in fact be leasing because we've turned over possession, use, and control. But we didn't write the contract that way. And the tax laws tax the transactions as they are, not as they may be if you redesign the transaction. So as they are right here, Jones transfers nothing to anybody, and as a result, there is no renting. This court's decision in the tanning bed case really does solve this problem. In your decision, the person who wanted to use the tanning bed got to go in the tanning bed. They got to touch it. They got to be within it. They got to get the benefits from it personally. No two people could be in it at the same time. The department chased them down thinking that that was also a rental transaction. And this court stopped the department from expanding the tax base as they're attempting to do so here by saying, even though that's true, they do actually get to use it and they're actually touching it in physical possession of it and no one else can use it at the same time, there's still an attendant there who looks at you and decides, you're sunburned, I'm not letting you in. Or you look fairly dark, I'm not letting you go 20 minutes. Or the machine's malfunctioning, I'm going to stop the session. And because the owner of the tanning bed maintained those controls, this court held, there is in fact no renting transaction going on. Our case is even better than the tanning beds. Here the owner does everything. The customer does nothing other than sign the contract and approve the ad copy. The same thing that they would do if an ad copy went into a magazine or into a newspaper or a radio or television ad. That's all the customer gets to do. And as a result of that, there's no leasing. If there's no leasing, there can't be a tax on leasing. And as a result, the entire assessment's invalid. I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Ben Updike. I represent the Arizona Department of Revenue. Um, the issue in this case is whether or not there is a lease, and that issue comes down to whether or not there is exclusive use of the billboards at issue and, and control of those billboards by the, the customer of Jones. Um, the, there are a couple of statements made just now by the opposing counsel that there was nothing transferred. Those statements are incorrect. What is transferred is the use of the bulletins for the entire period at issue, for the one year, the two year, whatever the customer des desires. Um, the use of the billboard is transferred, and that use is exclusive the entire time that the customer is under contract. Um, um, but more importantly, is the, the, the issue today is the issue of control. Well, the use doesn't have to be exclusive, right? So long as the contract is honored and the advertising is displayed, um, can't Jones use that personal property for, for other things? 
if, for example, Jones wanted to store old tools behind the uh, the advertisement uh, in, in the space behind the billboard, it could do so, right? I believe it could do so. However, I, what I'm talking about is the use of the billboard, the actual face that well, the service the service of, of displaying the message clearly Jones is obligated to do but the use uh, and control of the personal property sounds pretty lopsided from the undisputed facts in this case I mean if, if the if the advertiser isn't even allowed to go there isn't allowed to uh, amend the copy uh, or, or do anything like that how, how is this a lease as opposed to a service? The reason it's the least is because what's at issue is the physical face of the billboard. And uh, the record has shown that it's not, Jones does not have as complete control over the copy and over the art as they've just stated today. The taxpayer, the customer, can provide its vinyl to Jones, who will put it up on the face of the bulletin. And in that sense, it is the customer putting its vinyl on the property, on the real property, or on the personal property. But except the customer can't go there. The customer is never allowed to touch the personal property it's leasing. That is correct. It's a strange form of possession. However, they have all the possession, possession necessary for the use of a bulletin. The only use of a bulletin, except perhaps to store tools behind it, is to have your advertising copy up on the bulletin. That is the entire use, and the customer is the one who receives that entire use. How is it different from the tanning bed case, though, where the, the only use is, is tanning? But well, I, I don't think that it is specifically different on the use issue than the tanning bed. In the tanning bed, they did have exclusive use of the tanning bed. Just like here, we have the use of the bulletin. The entire use is to put your advertising up, and that is what the customer is getting. The difference between the tanning bed and is that they did not have the control over that use because of the severe restrictions placed in Energy Squared over the use of the tanning bed by the the company and by the oversight of that use by a tanning technician who said, no, you can't use it, you're too tanned, you're too dark, you're too burned, or you can only use it for five minutes. So the difference was in the control. Wasn't that the same problem here with this case, the, with Jones maintaining control? Jones cedes all of the control to the customer to make all of the important decisions over the use of the bulletin. Except Jones can transfer the location. They cannot unless the customer approves. If they transfer without the customer's approval, the contract is nullified. The customer gets the final say over whether it can be transferred. What, what's the personal property here? The, the structure that, it, that comprises the billboard, the, right? The structure, the, the okay. face of the, the bulletin. If, if the customer decides that it wants to install LED lighting instead of halogen lighting on the bulletin board, can it go do that? It cannot do that itself. Phones do that. Yes. That is correct. However, if, if, if the customer, if, if, if Jones decides that it wants to install meteorological instruments on top because it's a nice tall structure and it could measure wind for the nearby airport, could it do that? I don't think if it interferes with, Jones, with the customer's use, that it doesn't, it's not in the facts. We don't know, but. Well, but, but I'm, I'm saying there's, there's, there's nothing to suggest that, that Jones doesn't retain the ability to tinker with that structure that is the personal property, so long as it's fulfilling its commitment to display the advertising, right? That is correct, and doesn't interfere with that commitment. OK, so, so how is that a lease? I mean, if, 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 if I'm the lessee of personal property and the lessor comes and says, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to change this. I'm going to mess with it a little bit just because I feel like it. Maybe I can get some extra value out of it. I would feel my interest as a lessee impinged upon. But here, that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, uh, you've made a statement about Jones performing the actions. In the case, the, the issue is not whether the Jones performs it or not, or whether the customer performs it or not, that to me is a red herring. The question is who controls the performance. If the customer requests that there is a light on its billboard day and night, it mu Jones may shine the light, but Jones cannot make the decision to not put a light. If they do it, they owe a credit under the contract, they owe the customer for not doing what the customer has requested. But if Jones wants to, wants to change the personal property to use new lighting technology, Right? It thinks it can save some money by using some cheaper, brighter light bulbs. It can just go do that. I suppose, however, if the customer is not happy with the changes that Jones makes, the customer can change, can come and re, uh, undo the contract. That's, it, it's a little different than a rental car, though. If I'm renting a car and the, and the uh, rental owner decides it wants to use a new type of headlamp, it can't just go under the hood and change the lamps while I'm in a restaurant. It, it, I have exclusive control of that car while I'm renting it. 
I, I, again, I don't know if they could or could not make that decision while you're renting a car. I don't know if they said, you have to bring it back, we're going to do some maintenance on it. If they could, I, I, that's not. I, I suspect if you were renting a car, you might, you might feel a little hinky about seeing the hood pop open while you're having dinner and somebody changing the headlights. Yes, Your Honor, that, I would feel a little hinky. But the question is not the exclusive control about who performs it. The question is, who makes the decisions? And in this case, the customer makes the decisions over what goes up. If they wish to change what goes up, they tell Jones, and Jones does it for them. They are the controlling the decision about what goes up. Although Jones is performing the action, they're doing it on behalf of the customer because that control is passed to the customer for the duration of the lease. I'm just curious. Do you know if there's uh, uh, any, any precedent or practice as to the, uh, the rental of hospital beds to patients? I do not know where their hospital beds I mean, would that Would that be a lease? If I'm lying in a hospital bed solely, you know, sort of like a tanning bed, solely in the, the sole occupant of that bed, um, it is, would the department take the position that the hospital is in the business of leasing me personal property? Hopefully they are in the business of transient lodging because you don't stay at the hospital for too long, and that would be a different, different uh, business, but again, that's I don't think that's what is before the ca the court today. Well, but the hospital might also lease me a bunch of other medical equipment, right? I mean, they do. They charge they, a daily rate for for whatever equipment you use, and and believe me, nobody else wants to use it while I'm using it. But but they are transferring some form of of use to me that is exclusive for a period of time. W would that be a lease? Yes, interview? it could be. If if, for example, we went to the hospital and they gave us dialysis and we had to bring it home with us. They would lease us the equipment for the duration of the time we stayed at home using it. That's, that is, and that could be a lease. And uh, no, nobody would use it. Yes, you have control over it. You make the decisions on how it's used. Even if it's, even if it's in, a, in a fixed location. I mean, there might, be, there might be a difference if they're leasing it to me for a year to take home and do with what I will. But if, if it's simply something that a nurse wheels in uh, for my use, um, but but they're retaining sort of control of the maintenance and the the operation of that property. It's it seems to me that there's not too far fetched an analogy here. It is, but I would think that in the case when a doctor or a nurse or somebody is operating it, that again was in Peck and it was in Bentley uh, Grill or Dill Gridall and it was in Energy Squared. If there's an operator involved in the use of the equipment, then it is not a lease because the nurse or the doctor or they are making the decisions on how it's used. Even though you might have use of it, you don't have control over it because the operator in place is the one that's controlling it. In this case, there is no operator. Nobody sits and is using the equipment the entire time. It sits for 363 or 364 days a year just sitting out there. It's not being operated. What, what about the example of the electronic billboard that changes every few seconds? Do you, do you think this is sort of time division access where you'd have multiple lessees? I think that it depends on the facts of the, and the circumstances of the case, which we might make up and they aren't, they aren't before us directly. But it could be a lease if the similar facts existed where the customer has exclusive use for the durations of its lease. That, I have a question whether or not the electronic form is the same exclusive use. Well, let's take one of those old school billboards that had the, but it could the, be. the triangles that would rotate and change the sign. Do you remember uh, those? Yes, I do remember yeah. those. I mean, would that, would that be exclusive use? It could be, again, if the use is exclusive for the time that they're given under the contract and that's what they contracted for, as long as they have the use of that, it would be exclusive. For a, a period of time, it could be exclusive use. And again, the, the real issue, though, is not the use, which I, I believe the customers do have exclusive use of the, bill, the bulletin face that they're using. The issue is the control on who makes the decisions. In that case, it could be different. I mean, the facts of an electronic billboard or, an, or of a rotating triangle billboard could be different on who controls how it's used, whether the customer has input on when to start, when to finish. Um, but here we have those indicia of control. The customer selects its bulletin board or its, its bulletin. The customer selects the advertisement to go up. The customer selects when to start. The customer selects the options to go with it, with the lighting, with the way it faces, with the, and this, the customer also can select to extend its use of the bulletin, the customer has all of these. What if it gets dirty and faded in the sun? Can the customer go freshen it up? The customer cannot, but the customer can request that Jones go and freshen it up. If the customer, it's in the record that if the but customer. Jones says, no, that's not part of your contract. I mean, sorry, vinyl fades over time. You're on a highway, it gets dirty. Um, we're not, we're not going to go do that unless you pay us extra. 
And the customer would, in, in this hypothetical says, but wait, I leased this billboard. I just want to go freshen up my billboard. The customer does not do it, but the record actually in the deposition states that the customer can notice that there are damages to the bulletin, that the lighting is out. It even, Jones even admitted that sometimes the customer more, may notice problems with the bulletin and inform Jones of those, who, and Jones will then, on the customer's request, go and fix those. If there's something wrong with the bulletins, Jones acts as the agent or the... But if it's some subjective aesthetic thing that isn't really a defect, but just sort of a whim the customer has to to make it look a little better. It can't go and, and affect that change. The customer cannot itself perform the operations that affect the change. No, that's correct. However, the customer can ask the Jones do it on the customer's behalf. What's your response to the, uh, the legislative history uh, that seems to have suggest an intent to exclude uh, advertising? Um, the legislative intent about the advertising, the statements and the facts about the advertising classification, classification are correct, that it cannot be taxed any longer under the advertising classification. And that is the extent of legislative intent. That's the extent of the fact sheet. That's the extent of everything. But without it, you think it would have been, it could have been subject to double taxation? It would not have been subject to double taxation. The, the problem with Jones' argument in the advertising is that it makes a presumption that is incorrect. It assumes that each classification is completely separate and there is no overlap between the classifications. So therefore, if you remove one of the classifications, that can't fall into anything else. That is just not true. Classifications like do have overlap. a pretty specific exemption that was passed. That we, we no longer want advertising to be taxed. In Un I'm sorry. I can go ahead. It, it just seems it it just seems odd to suggest that the legislature would have said, but we're okay with it being taxed under a different section. They stated the actual statement of the repeal is that it cannot be taxed under the advertising classifications. Those are that is the length and the breadth of the intent. The the state is not taxing it under the advertising classification. So the question is whether or not it falls within the rental classification. If it falls within the rental classification because it fits within the scope then the legislature's intent towards the rental classification is that it should be taxed under that. Was it, there, excuse me, was there, is there anything in the legislative history that suggests the reason why the tax was repealed under the advertising uh, classification was because uh, the legislature believed it could be taxed under the personal property classification? There was nothing that the legislator made any statements about it being taxed under the personal property classification. But again, that doesn't stop it from fitting within the classification. The question of whether it fits within the classification is what, whether it meets the definitions of the scope of the, the rental classification. It seems to nullify that legislation that does away with taxing advertising. It doesn't, the state is not taxing under the advertising classification, which is, again, the, the intent of the legislature towards taxation is that each classification is discrete. Each classification it can be taxed or cannot. It can be exempt under this classification. If it's exempt under one, that doesn't mean it's not taxed under another. And so what, what was the legislature's intent in, in adopting this legislation that exempted advertising? Well, if you looked at the intent, the actual reason that it was, it was repealed is that it provided an unfair advantage to out-of-state advertisers who could then compete with in-state advertisers without tax, and it would make the advertising flee the state. That was the intent of the legislature. So they repealed the advertising in Arizona so that advertisers in Arizona had a level playing field with out-of-state advertisers. That does not apply to the case of bull bulletins because bulletins cannot be out-of-state. If they're in Arizona, then they can't flee out-of-state. So it doesn't... Cross well, people can decline to post them, though. They can. Um, that I mean, not, isn't that the same th the same thing that the, the legislature was worried about? Is people will advertise less if the if 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 the activity is taxed? That that, that maybe people will will decline to uh, to post billboards, um, and, and 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 therefore we should lower the tax to encourage the activity of advertising on billboards. Again, that's not in the, the record. There's no indication of that intent. I think that, I think that the only intent we have is what was stated in the record, and that is not what they stated. I mean, obviously, yes, that if it was lower, the people may be more inclined, or they may not be. I don't know, but that's not in the intent of the legislature. Um, I want to. Can I give an example of the, the premise that repealing advertising means it can't be taxed under anything else is just not correct. Classifications can be 
overlapping in some sense. For example, we have retail. Retail includes any sale at retail. That is an incredibly broad classification. It would include the, the restaurant classification because those are sales at retail. You go in, you buy your food, you give them money, they sell you something. However, that was carved out by the legislature onto a separate retail, restaurant classification. If the restaurant classification disappeared, that would fall back under retail because it is part of the more broad general retail classification. You think if the, if the legislature passed a tax or a statute repealing the, the restaurant tax that the logical uh, uh, course of the law would be that those sales are still taxed? Yes. It, they would be the, the, the legislature's act of repealing a tax shouldn't carry with it any, any indication of intent to make the activity free of tax? Yes, that is correct. Because if the retail classification did not want to include the restaurant classification, there would have to be a specific exemption under the retail classification. The legislature's act towards the restaurant classification in repealing it means only it cannot be taxed under restaurants, not that it affects any of the other classifications. And we that may is have different views on the legislature's enthusiasm for taxes. I, 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 don't, I don't get the sense that when the legislature repeals a tax, what it really means to do is sub silentio impose another tax. The legislature imposed that tax by passing the rental classification and by not withdrawing billboards or bulletins under the rental classification. There is no exemption for them. So under, just, just so I understand your position. What you're saying is that for advertising to escape taxation, a privileged tax uh, completely, in 1982 or three, when it started phasing out the tax under the advertising classification, the legislature had to also specifically uh, pass a, a law that exempted uh, advertising from any other taxable classification, including personal property. That is correct if the advertising is done through the rental of personal property. If it is not, there is no need to exclude it from any of the classifications. If it is done through the sale of retail property, then it would be taxed under retail. However, it is, if it fits within one of the classifications, it should be taxed under the la that classification. And, and, and if the advertising uh, is, is conducted by hiring people to, to hold signs up that have letters spelling out the ad, um, that's, a, that's a service, right? That's, that's not a rental of personal property? I believe that would be a service. It would not be covered by the rental classification. I don't see a rental in there like we have here. And if they stood on Apple boxes to make themselves a little taller, would that be a rental of personal property? Not unless they rented the Apple boxes from a different company. Or not unless there was some sort of rental agreement involved. What's the difference between the billboard and the Apple box? Because, because the billboard itself is not being, is, is not being rented. It is the, the contractual requirement to provide advertising. We've already established that the billboard itself can be used for other purposes, tool storage, uh, wind instruments, solar panels. Um, I mean, you have a structure here that, that the purported lessor is still free to use for other things. That is correct. However, what something is being used for does not mean, just because it's being used for advertising does not mean it is not a lease. If they do it through the method of a lease by passing the exclusive use and the control over the decisions of the bulletin, then it becomes a lease and it should be taxed under the leasing classification. If they did not pass the control, if they had severe restrictions in place like Energy Squared, it would not be a lease and it would not be taxable. Or if it was done through some other method like somebody waving a sign, which is, there is no lease, there is no transfer of, of personal property, then it would not be a lease. The only thing I wanted to mention is that Arizona Outdoor mentions that it came out, the department started taxing in 1988, the, the use of a bulletin as a lease. That, Arizona Outdoor focused on the transaction between the uh, landowner and the owner of a piece of personal property, namely the billboard. It did not focus on the transaction between the billboard operator and the advertiser, didn't it? No, it did not. That is correct. Because it wanted to determine whether it was a lease of tangible, of commercial property, which it was not. It was found to be a lease. It was found to be not commercial property. But in that case, they acknowledged that it was a lease. It's been a lease. The department has been taxing it since that case as the lease of tangible personal property when it switched from commercial to personal property. The, the belief that is a lease is not um, something that is unbelievable because the courts acknowledged it was a lease in those cases, in that case. It's not far-fetched to believe that it is a lease, especially with the relationship that we have and the facts we have in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Heard a couple interesting things I wanted to respond to. 
The first was the statement that Jones sees all control to the customer after the contract is signed. Um, that just is not true. The only thing the customer does is approve the ad copy, and at that point, the customer has no involvement at all in anything. It's Jones that takes over, orders the printing, receives the printing, places it up on the billboard, and monitors it the entire time. On the other hand, though, if Jones decided that it wanted to put up a few other ads, um, over half of the original advertiser's ad. That would be a problem. Right? You, the physics is right. Uh, you can't have two ads sitting in exactly the same spot at the same time. Or if, if, if you lease a thousand square feet of billboard and Jones decides that it wants to cover up 250 square feet with another ad that pays more, that would be a violation of the contract. It'd be a violation of the contract, but it doesn't mean that the person who had the thousand square foot advertisement is somehow controlling what happens on that billboard. But the content is, you, you would agree, is 99.9% .9 in the control of the of the customer? Well, it depends on who the customer is. A um, lot of small customers, and Jones has their billboards in the out-of-the-way places. You're not suggesting the tax would be different depending on no. how involved. So I'm assuming, unless it's something that just Jones finds offensive, the customer gets to dictate what goes on the... Uh, the customer gets to say, Either Jones drafted something, which happens in a lot of cases, and then shows it to the customer and says, here's the best Western in Sholo. Does this work for you? They say, yes, it is. They go and they get a vinyl made, and they put it up on the billboard. The rule's exactly the same, assuming it's McDonald's. They provide their own vinyl. They, they don't the provide. Design. But whatever it is, it would still, we, we need a rule that applies for both. Sure. McDonald's doesn't provide its own vinyl. The only thing McDonald's will do is say, as part of the national campaign, we have this is how the Big Mac should be displayed. And, and we'd like you to put this Big Mac up here on this particular billboard. But then it's up to Jones to take that transmittal. It's not a vinyl. And send it to the person who makes the vinyl, get it put on, and then go through the regular process. So the customer's only obligation in this is to sign the contract, pay the fee, and approve the ad copy that then goes up on the billboard. After that, everything goes to Jones. So when they said that the Jones gives control to the customer, they never relinquish control of their own tangible personal property, much in the way that you were talking about in a car rental. Uh, the other thing uh, that I thought was astounding was the department's novel theory that if the legislature said we want to stop taxing those people in the business of restaurants, we want to repeal the sales tax on those in the business of restaurants, then the department could say, well, you didn't say that they were exempt from the sales tax under retail, so we're going to go capture them there. And what you hear is the mindset of, there's got to be a way this is taxable. Let's figure out some argument that makes this taxable. The problem with that argument is that Article 9, Section 9 of the Arizona Constitution is very clear. Any statute that imposes a tax has to state what the direct object of that tax is. And so you don't get to say, well, I could fit an argument in that it's a retail sale of food to a customer in a restaurant, even though the legislature appealed the tax on restaurants, and that way it's still taxable. And it gets back to 1982. Do we really believe that with both taxes on the books, advertising and rental, that when the sign association went down and said, we'd like to stop paying tax, and the legislature agreed, that somehow it shifted the tax over to a different classification, so they're still paying tax, and it's the sales tax, it's just under a different reporting category. That would seem like malpractice on the part of the person who went down there to do it. I don't think he committed malpractice. I think he got exactly what he wanted to, which is after 50 years of sales taxation, the advertising businesses were taken out of the class of businesses subject to the sales tax. The legislature could put them in tomorrow. They haven't. I don't know if they will, but they certainly didn't during this audit period. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you both for your argument. We'll take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. We're adjourned.